Again, let's go ahead and get started with our next conversation. Again, we heard from leadership from the administration that included, of course, the Department of Justice, Department of Education. We heard from mayors in San Jose and Oakland who are leading this work, leading change in their communities. And we were talking about several initiatives, including the National Forum and Community-Based Violence Prevention. Now we also want to spotlight, as you all know this year, the summit is also hosted by, co-hosted by the My Brother's Keeper Task Force. And the person who leads that work is Broderick Johnson from the White House. He is also the assistant to the president and the cabinet secretary. He is one of the, uh, President Obama's closest advisors on this work, and we are delighted to have him. We also have, along with Broderick Johnson, we have uh, former mayor of Philadelphia, Michael Nutter. And for anyone who's um, had the pleasure of meeting the mayor before and talking with him, you know that he too is dedicated and passionate about this work. Even since leaving office, he has continued to champion the importance of building out opportunities for all young people, particularly our boys and young men of color. But I should also say what is going to be interesting about these two gentlemen coming on stage after the video is that you will have two dads talking about this work. And I think that's pretty special to have people in leadership who, again, this is also personal for them in terms of our children and our young people and the opportunities they need to succeed. And so with that, um, without further ado, the next voices that you hear after this short video that lays out a little bit of some background there on My Brother's Keeper, you will hear from Broderick Johnson and you will hear from Michael Nutter uh, having a conversation about creating opportunities for all young people, focusing on what is going on with My Brother's Keeper, and then uh, they will open it up for, for questions from the audience to have a conversation with you, uh, to hear from you about uh, this work and get a little bit of your perspective. And so uh, after the video, the next voices that you will hear will be Broderick Johnson and Michael Nutter. Thank you. Ladies, Ladies and, gentlemen, and gentlemen, I am very proud, very very proud, and proud and to, present to present the award for Best Actor in a Leading Role in 2024. For Cinematography. For Best Original Screenplay. Best Director. Your Class of 2028 Valedictorian. Class of 2032 Phi Beta Kappa Initiate. Graduating cum laude. Your next president. Put your hands together for our newest partner. Journalist, poet, James Beard award-winning chef. Introducing Supreme Court Justice. Distinguished Fulbright Scholar. 2027 Nobel Prize winner. The Honorable Acclaim. World-renowned. Award for Lifetime Achievement goes to. If we believe in their futures, they will believe in them too. I, I am my brother's keeper. I am my brother's keeper. Isn't that beautiful? Good morning. I, you know, I had, there's so many like favorite images in that video for me, but the one, the chef, the little kid with the big bowl, like, you know what, anything is possible. It really is. It, it's, uh, so it's great to be here with all of you at the Fifth National Summit on Preventing Youth Violence and to, to bring greetings and gratitude to all of you on behalf of the 44th President of the United States, Barack Obama. Yes. And I was, uh, I was born and raised here in this great city, so it's personally very moving for me to be here as a representative of the President of the United States. If the President were here with us this morning, I know he would express deep and genuine pride and uh, for the extraordinary and difficult work all of you are doing to create safe, and supportive communities for our nation's children and families. But before I say anything else, I, I want to begin with thanking Attorney General Lynch and the Department of Justice team for their exceptional work as members of the MBK Task Force and for their leadership of the National Forum on Youth Violence Prevention. The Department of Justice has been a critical partner in all of our MBK work, driving the agency's efforts, though has been the great work of my good friend, of several years, I won't say how many because she would get mad at me if I did, perhaps, and fellow University of Michigan Law School alum, Carol Mason, who serves as the Assistant AG for the Office of Justice Programs. Carol brings wisdom, passion, and urgency to her work each and every day, and she has assembled an extraordinary team, including Theron, Brent, Ed Silas, and so many others 
who have made this gathering possible, as well as countless policy reforms that they are making to change lives. So thank you, Carol, and thank you for the entire DOJ team. Let's give them a generous round of applause. I also want to recognize all the leaders of MBK communities from across the country who are here with us today. If you lead or help lead an MBK community program in your city, please wave your hand so we can acknowledge you as well. I'm sure there are many, many, many. This is a movement, folks. Uh, before our st I start our conversation with my good friend, Mayor Nutter, let me tell you a little bit about MBK, where we've been, and uh, where we're going. While the cornerstone of President Obama's domestic policy agenda has been about expanding opportunity, MBK has its roots in the wake of the death of Trayvon Martin. Following that tragedy and the subsequent trial, the President spoke to the nation eloquently and shared many thoughts, including some quite personal ones, as you all will remember. And he asked, quote, is there more that we can do to give the young people of this nation especially a sense that their country cares about them and values them and is willing to invest in them. So just a few months later, in February of 2014, the President answered his own question quite resoundingly. He launched MBK from the East Room of the White House with all the formality and the pomp and circumstance that is fitting any major presidential priority. MBK is focused on six key milestones from birth to adulthood that research shows us are especially predictive of later success and where interventions can have the greatest impact. The sixth milestone and the purpose of this summit is reducing violence and providing second chances. The belief that all youth and young adults should be safe from violent crime and also that individuals who are confined should receive the education, training and treatment they need for a second chance to break the cycles of recidivism. Since launching MBK, it has been met with excitement, tremendous excitement from communities, businesses, and organizations across the country. It has drawn the nation's attention to ways in which boys and young men of color and all youth may fall behind in the opportunities that they so desperately need so they can stay on the pipeline to success instead of the pipeline from school to prison. In response to the President's call to action, nearly 250 communities in all 50 states and the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico have accepted the President's MBK Community Challenge. 250 communities, folks. More than $600 million in private sector and philanthropic grants and in-kind resources have been contributed, and a billion dollars in low-interest financing, all committed in alignment with the vision of MBK. We've seen new federal policy initiatives and grant programs and guidance all being implemented every day to ensure that every child has a clear pathway to success from cradle to college and career. So what does this look like in action? Well, let me give you a couple of examples of how MBK communities working with the private sector and the federal government have been working to address the many challenges. Just last week, the Department of Education announced the winners of its Second Chance Pell Pilot Program, which will enroll roughly 12,000 12,000 incarcerated individuals in educational and training programs across the country. So they can pursue bachelor's degrees and master's degrees and occupational certificates. Department of Labor also recently announced that nearly $50 million will be available in pre-release and re-entry program grants. In November 2015, the Department of Justice, Justice awarded $2.5 Two million dollars to expand its Smart on Justice Juvenile Justice Initiative, which promotes juvenile justice system reforms with a focus on racial and ethnic disparities. Also in 2015, DOJ's National Initiative for Building Community Trust and Justice launched targeted efforts in six demonstration sites to help law enforcement agencies and communities strengthen trust and collaboration. You'll hear a lot more about the work of MBK communities in my conversation with Mayor Nutter and during a plenary session that will be hosted by Michael Smith of our White House team this coming Wednesday. But let me talk a little bit about a particular program that's based in Chicago, and that is Becoming a Man. 
BAM team is here today, so would you all stand up and we can acknowledge you. Where's the BAM team? They gave me the honor of sharing some exciting news that, uh, that is being uh, made public today. So let me just share a couple of things. Researchers from the University of Chicago Crime Lab are releasing new findings from a randomized controlled trial that evaluated BAM during the 2013, 14, and 15 academic years. Now, BAM is a school-based group counseling program that helps young men learn to use social cognitive skills such as considering the perspective of others in their actions and identifying and evaluating the consequences before acting. Researchers have found that BAM reduced violent crime arrests by 50 percent, reduced total arrests by 35 percent, and improved school engagement for male Chicago public school students. Those are extraordinary accomplishments thus far. In a long-term follow-up to the Crime Lab's first study of BAM in 2009 and 2010, the researchers have also now found that BAM increased on-time high school graduation rates by almost 20 percent. When the president launched MBK, he was proud to have students from the BAM program stand behind him in the East Room, not only because he was moved by their triumphs, but because BAM is a powerful example of an intervention with meaningful, rigorous evidence of impact. So again, congratulations, BAM. We're thrilled to see you and so many organizations that are dedicated to investing in what works. So in the coming months, uh, we have 200 or so days left in this incredibly consequential administration. But let me just remind everyone of something that Muhammad Ali famously said, and it's a mantra by which we live in the White House every day. We're not counting the days, but we're making every day count. So you'll see us doing, and, and that, that's driven by the President, believe me, every day. He's like, what else can we do today to change this country and to change the world? So you'll see us doing even more to leverage this unique moment and platform and continuing to call on all sectors to do what is necessary to make a difference for all of our children. And after that, after we leave the White House, after we turn over the keys, the President has made clear to us time and time again and to the nation he has said that he's committed to this work, the vision of MBK for the rest of his life, not just for the rest of his presidency. Now, I can't think of a better person to have this conversation with about MBK than my friend, the former mayor of the city of bro brotherly love, Michael Nutter. So now I'm going to join Mayor Nutter here, and we're going to have a little bit of a conversation. And it's great to see you. Again. I think there's something here I have to switch on because I can't talk that loud. Yeah. Let me just say a couple of things about Michael Nutter. He was the 98th mayor of Philadelphia, serving from 2007 until just this past year. He is currently a professor of professional practice in urban policy at Columbia's School of International and Public Affairs. He's a previous member of the Philadelphia City Council and Ward Democratic leader. While mayor, Michael was responsible for transforming the city of Philadelphia, reducing crime rates and expanding opportunity through programs like the Mayor's Office of Reintegration Services for Ex-Offenders, the Youth Violence Reduction Partnership, and MBK Philly. He also served as a national leader as president of the U.S. Conference of Mayors, co-chair of the conference's MBK Task Force, and he continues to serve on, in an advisory role with the My Brother's Keeper Alliance. Mayor Nutter also joined forces with Mayor Mitch Landrew of New Orleans to create Cities United, an initiative focused on eliminating the violence in American cities that so impacts the lives of African American men and boys. Mayor Nutter, again, thank you for everything that you do, brother. So we'll get this conversation started. Yeah. Can I call you Michael? <laughs> Mayor Nutter, <laughs> we've had many conversations about MBK, and, but I remember you saying publicly at one of the first events I did with you in Philly 
that MBK is one of the most important policy efforts you have led in your impressive and accomplished 30-year career. Would you elaborate on that a bit? Sure. And um, Mr. Secretary, thank you uh, very, very much, Broderick. <laughs> um, but most importantly, thank you to all of you uh, for being here uh, today. And certainly want to thank Carol Mason and Theron Pride uh, and uh, Broderick Johnson. Please recognize all of them and the great work that they've done. Um, you know, as they say, regardless of what level, leadership really starts at the top. And uh, to have the President of the United States of America, and in particular, President Barack Obama, uh, so um, directly, clearly, at times painfully, express uh, his concerns about what's going on in the lives of young men and boys of color uh, should inspire any of us, regardless of where we're from, what our jobs are, what we look like, where we grew up, uh, to be involved in uh, this work. And so, um, you know, when I left uh, high school uh, to go to the University of Pennsylvania, uh, what I, I wanted to become a doctor, uh, primarily for the purpose of helping people. Um, chemistry three changed my life uh, pretty significantly, <laughs> and um, it was pretty clear that wasn't going to work out. Um, but ultimately, uh, I got this other job uh, to lead the fifth largest city in the United States of America, a million and a half people, and I had the opportunity every day to help people. And that's what this is really all about, and that's what the President uh, has asked us to do. Uh, I think directed us and commanded us uh, to do. And so the opportunity to save lives and turn lives around, rebuild communities, invest in people, uh, and help them live uh, to their fullest potential uh, as a public servant, as a citizen, it just doesn't get any better than that. So uh, that uh, should be uh, the kind of work that all of us uh, in one way, shape, or form are engaged in. And that's why uh, this work is so important and why I thank you for what you're doing. You know, I, in any MBK city I go to, and I'm sure then you, you had this, uh, uh, this moment in Philadelphia many times, when I would mention to people that the President of the United States cares so deeply about them, uh, I think in the beginning I kind of expected it to be like, yeah, sure. Right. But what I found instead was like, they got it. They, the young people would say, yeah, we believe this President cares about us, mm -hmm. um, that he loves us. Um, and go back and tell the president that we said we need better schools, get right. the guns out of our neighborhoods. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and yeah. they felt like they are going to be, they're being heard, right? right? And so could you talk a little bit about that in terms of ta talking to young people in Philadelphia, as you said, yeah. about how this is a priority for this particular president that he means? Yeah, I mean, there's no question. I mean, when you, uh, you know, if you ever have the opportunity, um, whether, as uh, Broderick mentioned earlier, the announcement from the East Room, I've been to the East Room on more than a few occasions for very serious events and activities when the U.S. Conference of Mayors meets uh, every year in Washington, D.C. Uh, there's always a, a moment uh, where the mayors, two, 200, 250 or so mayors, are asked to come to the White House, we meet with the President for about an hour in the East Room. Uh, and so uh, he takes this work very, very seriously. Whenever I've talked to the President, whether in D.C. or in Philadelphia or somewhere else, he always asks what's going on on the ground, how are things uh, going in communities, in neighborhoods, how is MBK going, and of course I first always uh, commend uh, uh, Broderick and the, and the work that he's doing. So it's real. Uh, and I, I think the way the President expresses himself in such a personal way, uh, I mean, I think I almost know uh, the President's life story uh, just about uh, as well as my own, and the things that he has acknowledged, and the things that he did, and but for uh, various people in his life, he may have gone uh, in a different direction, the mistakes uh, that he has made. I don't know, uh, and I mean, I only know two Presidents, but um, I, I don't know in my lifetime that I've uh, met someone who has been so personally expressive uh, about his uh, life experience uh, than President Barack Obama. And I think that that's what makes it uh, so real uh, for all of us. And I've tried to, in many ways, uh, do uh, some of the same things. So, you know, I mean, I, I didn't, I'm not some uh, rags to riches life story, just, you know, kind of middle, middle class neighborhood out in West Philadelphia. 
Um, we may not have had much, but we appreciated uh, what we had. I tried not to get in very much trouble, uh, or at least trouble that my parents found out about. <laughs> uh, you know, but you know, any one of us uh, can go uh, in uh, a couple different directions. And I think the difference in the, and, and the impact for me was, you know, I had a job uh, from the time I was 13 years old. Uh, the only time I have not had a job uh, is when I resigned my job in city council to run for mayor. Uh, pretty late in my life to be unemployed uh, for 18 months. But um, I had mentors, I had supporters, I had a real neighborhood uh, where, uh, at, and this is a little bit of olden days stuff to some extent, but any neighbor on the block, any neighbor on the block had permission to tell any of us as kids what to do, where to be, and all of that. Mm -hmm. uh, and that really, for me, is, is about community. Um, I, you know, learned very early on, uh, there's, you know, time, uh, and my mom's name is Catalina, and then there's Catalina time, <laughs> right? And the time was, when the street light goes out, have your butt on the steps. I mean, it's very, very clear uh, what, what the expectations were. And my conversations with young people uh, have mostly been about setting expectations, setting boundaries, they actually want uh, some rules and regulations. They want to know the parameters. They want high expectations for them. If we set them high, they will, in many instances, do their best to meet them. If we set them low, uh, then they'll succeed in that uh, each and every day. So, uh, you know, part of our job as adults is to set high expectations, be very clear with our young people. Here are your options, here are your opportunities. But also, I think, a different conversation about, but unfortunately, here are the consequences of you not paying attention and keeping your stuff together. And we have to be honest with them uh, about uh, what life can bring. Mm -hmm. I would ask every one of you in this room, if you have the opportunity to go to a middle school, high school, even grade school, uh, elementary school, tell your life story. You probably weren't always successful all the time. I know we're all, you know, highly successful and we got our things together now and, you know, it ain't life grand. There may have been some moments in your life uh, where you aren't doing exactly what you should have been doing or you face some challenges or even failures. Share those stories with young people. They need to hear that. Yeah, you know, uh, again, I grew up in this city and uh, it all kind of began for me. Um, and I think about my path. My mother would frequently um, tell the story about me as a second grader at a, a, an elementary school here in the Park Circle area, for those of you who are familiar with Baltimore. And her being called, her, my dad and my mom being called up by the second grade teacher to have a conference about me because I was on my way to reform school, hmm. right? This is second grade. Second reform, grade. Really, yeah. Uh, reform school was like the school to prison pipeline right. thing. That was a different expression for it. But so I got transferred to a Catholic school. Okay. First I was taken home and I got some Mary <laughs> Louise Johnson time, right? right. And, yeah. Uh, right. <laughs> then it was like, and you know what the nuns will do, right? right? So, yeah. uh, so that was the beginning, but it wasn't like those expectations then suddenly changed and everything was, was great. I had to face a lot of the same challenges. Sure. High school, college, law school, right. you know, come on, you really can't. You're, right. you're, you're gonna, oh, yeah. you're gonna, and, and understanding, I was lucky, and the president talks about this oftentimes yeah. as well. So I think it's important to share those stories. There's mm -hmm. no doubt about it, because mm -hmm. as the president will say to the White House men mentees many times, you guys, and they're like 17, 18, 19 year olds, you guys are doing so much better than I was doing at your age, right? right? Yeah. One of the things that uh, really struck me among many when you and I first were talking about your strategies in Philadelphia was you focused on jobs, summer jobs, mm -hmm. as a violence reduction strategy because yeah. you had a sense of like within two weeks of school, of the school ending, what was happening yeah. if there was no choice. Would you, right. would you talk about that a little bit? Sure. How well, they guided your MBK yeah. work in Philly? As I said, you know, I, I was fortunate uh, to, uh, to get a job and have one consistently. The neighborhood drugstore uh, from the time I was 13 through, my freshman, through the end of my freshman year in college. So, I mean, I have always had a really good sense of the importance of summer jobs and even year-round uh, employment, but as mayor, um, you know, the responsibility goes up. So uh, just a couple shout outs. Um, Julie Wertheimer is here from uh, the city of Philadelphia uh, and uh, you'll see some folks running around with uh, Power Corps PHL uh, t-shirts on. It's a program that, that we created to help young people 
uh, get that job uh, opportunity. And in many instances, and I would suggest take this back to your respective cities and mayors, you know, government has a responsibility, in my view, uh, to uh, more oftentimes than not be on the leading edge, the cutting edge, the pushing edge, and demonstrating by leadership uh, what you want to get done. And so I don't ask folks to do what I'm not prepared to do first. And so I set a challenge of having 10,000 summer jobs uh, for young people in the city of Philadelphia. Um, and of course, the first entity that needs to step up is the city of Philadelphia. And so all across the government, virtually every department and agency had to participate, uh, and we put money uh, behind it. It's one thing to have a goal. It's another thing you have to fund these things. You have to pay for these things. Um, and then personally on the phone with CEOs and chairs of boards, you know, give me five jobs, give me 10 jobs, give me 25 jobs, whatever the case may be. And also acknowledging that many uh, companies won't necessarily participate in your summer jobs program, ours is Work Ready Philadelphia, uh, but have their own. Well, those are summer jobs as well. Uh, and so we did meet uh, our summer jobs challenge for my last summer, 2015, uh, 10,826 jobs. Uh, for young people in the city of Philadelphia. Um, it is a violence reduction strategy because it's keeping young people out of harm's way or from being either a perpetrator or a victim. And some weeks in Philly, you can be both. Um, it's just kind of the way it goes. But it's also putting money in that young person's pocket. And let's be very, very clear. Uh, many uh, are probably not putting that money in their 401k. Um, you know, they're going to spend it. Uh, and so actually that money is being recirculated uh, throughout the community. But I think the most important uh, aspect of it all, and I'm still carrying around a business card from a young guy uh, who was uh, in the Cristo Ray School uh, in Philadelphia, subsequently graduated. But many of the young people had business cards. And I committed to having four of their students in the mayor's office every year for all of my time. On the back of his card, he's listed the different jobs that he had in the city of Philadelphia as a part of his calling card to let people know, I've been working, I've been doing things, I'm developing a resume. And that's what this is really all about. Many of our young people don't necessarily have uh, some uh, uh, guidance uh, or uh, mentorship uh, or even examples of folks who are going to work each and every day. And what I say to the young people is, you know, when you have this job, you actually have to come every day, not every other day, not when you feel like it. The job starts at 9. I'd like you to be here at 8.55. It's over at 5. You should stay to 5.15. And you can't curse out every person that you have an encounter with um, <laughs> that you're having a bad day about. I mean, well, you have to learn these yeah, things. That's right. We learn these things. They have to learn these things. And so that's why we did uh, what, uh, what we did with the Summer Jobs Program. And uh, my successor has set an even larger goal for uh, the next uh, few years going forward. Youth violence went down uh, during uh, those uh, summers uh, in the city of Philadelphia because young people had an alternative, a positive alternative for them. Yeah, I, I want to commend you. You mentioned your successor. I want to commend you for the, and your team for the work that you did in working with your successor and your successor's team and making sure that MBK Philadelphia continued on course. And one of the things we worry about, quite frankly, is what happens when a strong mayor who believes in MBK leaves office and the successor may not have the same priorities or might see that as, well, that was one of, that was yeah. one of his things. You took a very, very determined approach about that. I remember that. And you want to talk about that a little bit because there's a lesson, yeah. some well, lessons to learn from uh, that. You know, I, I think, first of all, um, you win an election, you have your priorities, the things you ran on, et cetera, et cetera. I, I think um, men and boys of color dead in the street has to be everybody's priority, regardless of what election or who you are or where you came from. I mean, it's just, um, you can do it the way we did it, you can do it your own way, you can put your thumbprint on it, whatever the case may be. That's your prerogative, you won. Um, when MBK came along, and again, just from a pure timing standpoint, the president announces it in 2014. I'm going out of office in January of 16. So I've got a pretty short runway to kind of pull it all together. We had a great team. We did all six milestones. And fortunately, we had 
people who are already in leadership positions for the six milestones, which is why we did the six. Kicked out our, uh, our plan uh, pretty early on with one very strategic decision. Knowing that I was going out of office, not knowing who the next mayor was going to be, my name is not on the cover of the MBK Philadelphia plan. My name is mentioned once in a photo with a young boy, and I think there are two photos. My name is only mentioned once in that entire report. It's not my plan. It is MBK Philadelphia's plan. So, I mean, especially on the political side, I mean, we just, there are moments, there are issues. We can't allow ego to get in the way of results. I didn't invent trash pickup, snow removal, or water flowing through pipes. But the city was doing that before I showed up, while I was there, and I can assure you it's happening right now. Monday is trash day in the section of the city I live in. I have a 100% assumption, even out of office, that my trash is getting picked up today. And so you have to infuse these programs and issues and ideas into the lifeblood of the city that it becomes a standard operating procedure. It's just what we do. Yeah, that's right. It's just what we do. I have to tell you, one of the, um, so many proud moments around MBK thus far, and um, the President expresses this so often. One of those moments, uh, of course, though, was I remember I went and gave him an update on MBK Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. And it laid out all the data that you were looking at and how you were starting to measure results. Yeah. It also had a 90, almost $90 million figure associated with it in terms of new investments that you had been able to articulate. Why was that so important to have that in your, uh, in your documents? Well, you know, um, I've always taken the position that um, budgets are more than numbers and words on a sheet of paper. Budgets actually reflect your priorities and your commitment. Uh, it's one thing to be, you know, everybody knows the whole uh, ham and eggs uh, analogy and, you know, the chicken's enthusiastic, the hog is fully committed. So if you're really committed to something and it has a cost to it, then you have to identify the cost and then identify the resources. And so, again, fortunately for us, uh, and the way we did this was uh, there were a number of programs and initiatives, some of which were already in place, that lined up very well with one or more of the various milestones. And so we pulled those dollars together uh, and said, this is what we're allocating, dedicating, focusing uh, our uh, commitment to MBK, and here are the resources uh, to do it. Um, and I think at the same time, for all of these programs, I'll go back to the announcement that you made, uh, which is really uh, critically important um, and will, uh, will eventually demonstrate uh, the brilliance of uh, MBK, which is about data. Uh, and so you heard uh, Broderick, the Secretary, uh, talk about becoming a man, BAM, a program in Chicago, and there's some folks from the uh, Crime Labs and University of Chicago here. Uh, we have to not only implement great programs, but then scale up fully those that are working. So putting resources behind the BAM program and what Mayor Emanuel was doing with an additional uh, and doubling down uh, $4 million of Title I money to support that program, um, some of you may be in cities where you have a lot of different programs that are doing a lot of different things. At some point in time, you really have to evaluate these programs. And I know Joe has been around for a long time, and Joe's organization has always received funding, but you really have to do what, you know, Rosanna uh, Ander and her team out in the University of Chicago are doing, which is have an evaluation of the program. Joe may be a great person, but the program is really not doing what needs to be done. And you might have to hurt Joe's feelings. That's right. That's Joe right. might not That's be right. able to get that funding. And so when the economic crisis hit for us in 8, 9, and 10, we brought all of those folks together. And we started going through an evaluation process. And you have to put evaluation in the documents for your various programs that you're going to pay money for. This is about outcomes, 
not about nostalgia. That's right. That's right. This is about outcomes, not nostalgia. That's and right. just because you've been getting funded for the last 10, 15, 20 years doesn't necessarily mean that you should continue getting funded or going into the future when your program is not showing the kinds of results that we're seeing from a program like uh, Becoming a Man, 45% reductions, 55% 50 reductions uh, in uh, criminal activity or being engaged with the system, that's real. And now we have to figure out how do you take it up that it's not just serving a couple thousand young people, but tens of thousands all across the cities of America. We actually can solve these problems. It's about political will, and it's about money, and it's about focus. All three of those we can actually do if we decide that that's what we want to do. Yeah, and you, you look, you just crystallized what is uh, right at the core of the President's vision in creating MBK the way he did, and that is there's a lot of good intentions out there. There's a lot of money spent. There are a lot of folks who can tell wonderful anecdotes about a, a child's life being changed, and those are important. Mm -hmm. But we have a responsibility and an opportunity to measure things ri as rigorously as anything else gets measured. Mm -hmm. And that is a fundamental difference in how people are looking at the work around these yeah. issues. Yeah. And it will live on. And I think if you can show that data and show that evidence, then those programs will attract even more funding, which is, right. you know, the, uh, I would say the second wave, uh, if you will, of, right. of what MBK is all about in the, the uh, foundation community and the corporate community uh, and many, many others. But, I mean, they're going to invest in what's working. Uh, and so, uh, I mean, that's why uh, MBK and Cities United and these uh, kinds of projects and programs are so critically important. So I, I just ask you, please, evaluate, reevaluate, and then insist on uh, rigorous uh, uh, trials uh, and evaluation programs as a part of uh, what you're doing. None of us have any money to waste, but I think more importantly, we have no lives to waste, exactly. and children are dying because of what's going on in our streets every day. That's our job and responsibility. That's right. That's right. I think uh, we have just a couple minutes perhaps to take some questions from the audience. I think we can just take two minute, two questions. Um, so somebody just affirm that with the lights only, I can't only see. Only because I have to catch a plane. So, only because I that. wouldn't love to stay here. <laughs> Are there any, uh, here's one right here. Right there. Okay. Would you can't, stand up can't, please? Can't so we, see you. Yeah, because we have these <laughs> lights that are kind of blinding us here. Uh, Mark Rivers from Seattle, supervisor with the street outreach team uh, for the YMCA. Um, my question to you is, is um, great job on that summer program. Um, what did you guys do as far as preparing those uh, young men and women uh, to be prepared to go and deal with those, yeah. um, those, those issues on the job? Sure. How to communicate their issues, yeah. um, how to show up the next day um, and, and still produce. Uh, yeah. what, what, what did you guys do? I got it. So, um, so our main partner uh, in this work is an organization, it's a nonprofit organization back home called Work Ready Philadelphia. Um, they're our primary partner. They work with the young people. They screen the young people. They go through a process before that young person ever shows up uh, at uh, the workplace. Second, um, you know, within reason, they try to get a sense of, you know, what's your interest. Um, and so, you know, it really doesn't make a whole lot of sense uh, to uh, have someone do an internship, for instance, in a hospital, uh, and they're afraid of blood. I mean, you know, it's like, that makes no <laughs> sense, right? So <laughs> we find something else for you. So, uh, and it won't be a perfect match, but I mean, you just want to do something that's common sense. Um, but even before that, um, so I would usually make my summer jobs program announcement or challenge usually somewhere in the November, December time frame, right? So, I mean, it's starting to get cold in Philly, and we're talking about the summer, but you need a lot of runtime uh, for that. And uh, I would talk about it a great deal myself and my team uh, at every, you know, virtually every high school appearance uh, we ever made. And so part of it is just getting people used to the idea. I know it's new November, December. You need to be thinking about what you're doing this summer, talking to their parents. What are you doing this summer? Can't just be hanging out. Uh, and um, I, I think keeping young people busy and active and engaged uh, in uh, caring, nurturing environments uh, will make a tremendous difference. But there's a lot of prep work uh, that, uh, that goes with that because uh, um, everybody's not ready. 
It's time for one so more I, quick question. I, I had to steal the mic because Karen would shut me down, but I know that several people <laughs> asked Where me are this you, question. Where are you, Carol? I recognize the voice, <laughs> but, right, I know the voice. But it's a question that I know that some yeah, of you asked me, program. and I said to ask Mayor Nutter. <laughs> yes. And so this way, everybody gets Just to hear it. the answer. How did you deal with, I know you, oh, will, you all tackled the data sharing issue to make sure that you had people communicating with the schools and law enforcement. Can you tell people how you did that? Sure, quickly. Um, you know, data sharing, always a challenge uh, with every respect uh, to including, up to and including uh, uh, Carol and, and, and Broderick are wonderful attorneys in their own right. Um, but, uh, you know, you have these ideas, you want to share data, and then there are, you know, 19 different laws uh, that really kind of get in the way of the data sharing. But if you stay on it and stay focused and folks understand what it is that you're trying to commu communicate and trying to share and have an intergovernmental uh, agreement uh, on uh, that data sharing, you can get through it. It will take some time. Don't give up. The one thing that government has uh, beyond anything else is tons and tons of data. We collect more stuff than we know actually what to do with. Uh, and worse, um, sometimes in our analysis, we're not even analyzing the right thing. Uh, but that data is there, uh, and uh, it really does need to be shared, uh, which will help uh, in the whole evaluation process. There's a lot of trust uh, involved in this, and people get nervous, uh, and uh, your attorneys will, doing their job, will always do their best to protect you. The flip side of that, and the meetings I had, because I couldn't go to a lot of those meetings because my head would explode, uh, was do not forget what the goal is here, what the purpose is of this data, um, and let's not trip over ourselves to protect ourselves in such a way that we can't actually do our jobs. That's right. Well, thank you very oh, much. Oh, but Mayor she stole Michael the Nutter. mic. She she has power. You had one more here. No, I, oh, that was a two and a half. <laughs> I mean, that that was a that was a that was a uh, taking a. a and I forgive her for BMA. Yeah. We love what you're doing, but how does that uh, align with Black Male Achievement Initiative? Uh, and because it's so close together, and specifically to get some of the money. Yeah. And uh, how do we not leave our girls behind? Can we do something for sisters? Keep sure. Them, and keep the faith base engaged. So a couple of things very quickly on that. So in in Philadelphia, uh, during my time, uh, we had both the. Uh, person directing uh, MBK activities and uh, black male engagement. Um, they, they are positions in the government. Um, in the uh, current city administration, as I best understand it, uh, there is one uh, young person, uh, Jack Drummond, uh, who was in charge of both. Again, that's a prerogative of uh, any uh, administration. Um, we, uh, in one of our, uh, one of our MBK um, uh, gatherings in Philadelphia, uh, we did seek to address, uh, and we in no way, shape, or form uh, mean to leave uh, our young women out, uh, young women of color, uh, out of uh, the conversation, the equation. I, I think the issue here is when you looked at the data, uh, it was very, very clear uh, that the disparities and the need uh, with young men and boys of color was so way off the charts uh, that two things. One, helping that constituency actually has a benefit. Uh, with uh, young women, but in no way, shape, or form uh, are they mutually exclusive uh, and uh, should certainly be included uh, and have their own uh, standing uh, in their own right. But the, the data was telling us uh, that uh, we had to at least first try to focus on young men and boys of color. When you look at all of the stats from violence to shootings to homicides, uh, black men and, and uh, young men and boys of color are so way off the charts uh, compared to any other cohort uh, that in the, at least the government world, I mean, you do have to make some decisions about where you're going to start. That doesn't mean that's the be all and end all. It doesn't mean you're going to start there and stop there, but you do have to start somewhere. And the rates of death uh, in shootings for young men and boys of color are beyond anything else uh, that's, uh, that's going on in cities across America, but certainly no disrespect. Uh, and our young women need help and support uh, as well, and I've been involved with the Council on Women and Girls uh, out of the That's White right. House, uh, right. which uh, Valerie Jarrett uh, and a number of others, and the Women's Conference that just took place yeah, I believe, last week yep. uh, is critical to this country, but something directly and clearly has to be done uh, for these young men and boys of color. Mr. Mayor, I know you've got a flight to catch. I do. All right. Thank you. So thank you thank so you. much.